The Homeless Crisis. By Ronan Smith. And Callan Molander. This is our question. Why have homelessness populations increased along the West Coast, and how are governments and organizations attempting to provide support and combat it? Gentrification. So according to Webster's Dictionary, gentrification is the process by which basically poor people are forced out of an area because wealthier individuals move in and the rent prices go up. Um, the areas are improved because as wealthier individuals move in, more taxes are pumped into the area. This leads to the cities doing more government-funded projects like improving roads and sidewalks. This also leads businesses to invest more into the area with the creation of new businesses is and um, just like apartments getting better and all those things. This all pushes out the lower class individuals that live there as they can no longer afford the raised price of things like rent or groceries. This is prevalent in large cities, especially in places like Portland. And I'm not sure if every single one of us here has been to a gentrified area, whether you knew it or not. This process disproportionately affects minorities as they tend to live in these poor communities that are gentrified. Minorities are also disproportionately affected by it, as their communities are generally the ones demolished for the construction of the public works projects, projects like freeways, hospitals, or schools. This whole process leads to a lack of affordable housing. This is a very important to know, as it is one of the key causes of homelessness. The organization American Progress explains how this can be prevented through the use of anti-displacement measures, which are government programs that prevent lower-income individuals from being just forced out of their homes onto the street. So affordable housing, this is um, a lot of the reasons for the lack of this is caused by gentrification. And it is probably one of the most important reasons we have such a homelessness problem, because if we had more homes, they wouldn't be homeless. This has actually been a problem in Oregon for a long time, even back in the late 19th century. An OPB article was talking about how Oregon has having a hard time finding housing for all the lumber workers. So they mass produced these really cheap houses and it solved the problem. One of the reasons we currently lack this affordable housing is because there aren't enough people building new, cheap, mass-produced housing. The OPB article talked about how Oregon's homelessness has grown, explains that Oregon's, relative to other cities like Philadelphia and Detroit, actually have relatively low poverty rates. But unlike those cities, Portland and San Francisco have an incredibly high homelessness rate, which at first doesn't make sense until you realize that Philadelphia and Detroit have an abundance of cheap, affordable housing that we lack on the West Coast. This allows people in extreme poverty to still live in a home because they can find them for cheaper. This article also talks about how to replicate what these East Coast cities have. Oregon would need to build around 140,000 homes. Another reason why we, why we have lost these affordable homes is that many of them have been turned into vacation homes or bought up by large corporations that can then raise the price without any competition, creating a monopoly on affordable housing. Inflation. Inflation is nearly always going up. Sometimes that can actually be a good thing. Other times it can be a really, really, really bad thing. If inflation is going up at the same rate that wages are going up, then in general, that means the economy is doing good because people are still able to buy things. Their purchasing power isn't changing. But if inflation goes up while wages do not, you enter a period of stagflation. Stagflation is when the cost of goods and services continues to rise at a rate faster than your wage. This lowers your purchasing power, which is the amount of goods and services the money you make can buy. An example of this over a long period of time is the federal minimum wage. One would think the government raises the minimum wage at the same rate as inflation, but they do not. According to Statista.com, minimum wage in the year 2000 accurately adjusted for today's inflation would be $9.18 an hour. In, actua in actuality, the current federal minimum wage is far lower, only being $7.25 per hour. This gap may not seem significant, but when you're living paycheck to paycheck, this is a 22% pay decrease, and that can be hugely significant. According to organizations like Compassion.org, inflation rate and poverty rate can be connected together because of this. The rise in inflation can especially harm children, as families who have to provide for them can really struggle even under the slight increase of their expenses because they rely on these minimum wages. Hostile architecture. While you may not have realized it, I guarantee that everyone in this room has at one point seen hostile architecture. The goal of hostile architecture is to almost always prevent the development of homeless camps or people sleeping in areas they aren't supposed to be. Though occasionally, it could be to prevent the loitering of teenagers and other people like that. An OPV article called Hostile Architecture in Portland talks about a massive 
private company who convinced the police to forcefully remove all the homeless people off the street in front of her business and then proceeded to pay for the installation of a large line of bike racks to block space for the homeless people to come back and live in. This article also talks about how Portland and the whole country is, uh, now designs things like benches in such a way to prevent people from sleeping on them. Along with private companies now basically starting to control who is allowed to be outside of their establishment. While things like bike racks or metal bars lining the curve are more passive methods of hostile architecture, Portland has used far more aggressive tactics at forcing homeless people out. OregonLive.com talks about how Portland has cleared out large homeless encampments near like um freeways only to then dump truckloads of boulders to prevent them from coming back and setting up camp again while hostile architecture is in fact anti-homeless sometimes it isn't um it felt important important to make sure it was known that, um like things like metal bars on the corners of curbs to prevent skateboarders or lacks of benches and seats in public areas to prevent loitering these are all other examples of hostile architecture that don't affect homelessness but affect us Here's some more examples of hostile architecture. As you can see, all of these would prevent homeless encampments from being built. Drug addictions. Most homeless people are reliant on some sort of drug for 38% of homeless people. It is alcohol. Another 26 do some drug, generally an opioid, which is contributing to our current opioid epidemic. Nationalhomeless.org talks a lot about the spiral effect that drug addictions can cause. Because those who are addicted to drugs are unable to do things like keep a stable job, they can't afford to get the help they need to break their addictions. Those who are addicted to drugs are also generally not in a stable state of mind. This can prevent them from making good decisions about their lives. This leads to homeless drug addicts having far more run-ins with the police and spending far more time behind bars, which only hurts their ability to get a job even more. The saddest part about it is that most drug-using homeless people only start using drugs after they become homeless. This is because of a large amount of stress put on them to try and survive on the streets. This all goes back to the spiral effect that NationalHomeless.org was talking about and how hard it is to recover from homelessness and drug addiction. The way you can help solve this problem is instead of arresting the homeless people who abuse drugs, you send them to rehab and provide them with a stable job when they get out. This way they can lift themselves back up onto their feet. Here are some examples of what drug addiction can do to people. Yeah. All right. So mental health problems are very similar to drug addictions in the way that there's a spiral effect that happens that makes it incredibly difficult to get out of homelessness. The BBRfoundation.org explains how 25% of homeless people are seriously mentally ill compared to just 4% of the general population, and another 45% have some sort of mental impairment that affects them on a day-to-day. And this is only like the confirmed cases. Most likely, there are far more, because it's really hard to actually diagnose them with these illnesses. Mental illness contributes to homelessness because it harms the individual's ability to maintain a job. If you are mentally ill, you are unable to keep a job or work hard or continue to show up to work because you're just mentally unable to do these kinds of things. The solution to this problem is you need to um, supply them with a steady home to live in and counseling and a steady job that they can work with so that way they can actually get better. COVID-19. The last bullet point on this slide is probably the most important. COVID just made every other problem far worse. Because the economy was shut down, mass layoffs happened at large companies, along with many places just completely closing forever. This leads to a huge spike in unemployment rates, which creates a lack of jobs that can lead to homelessness. The housing market also really sucked for buyers during this time period, leading to a growth in the lack of affordable housing. This created stagflation as the price for goods shot up without a rise in wages. All of this is explained by the article UnitedWayNCA.org. The virus also caused the lives of homeless people to become far worse as they were far, far more likely to have serious symptoms from the virus, yet they couldn't afford to get treatment for it. And if they did get treatment, it would only put them in more debt. Portland. Since 2015, according to OPB article, Portland has seen almost a 65% growth in homelessness. In that time, they've also spent around $1.7 billion to hopefully prevent this growth. This created 4,608 affordable housing units for the homeless. In an interview, Tina Kotick explains how she's going to try and solve this growing homelessness problem by continuing to build affordable housing and setting up designated homeless encampments. 
According to Portland.gov, they explain how one of the key problems they are trying to solve when it comes to this homelessness problem is drug abuse and mental health, which as explained earlier is one of these key causes of homelessness as it creates this cycle effect where they just cannot get off the streets. Going back to the hostile architecture slide, it is very prevalent in Portland. It's really impossible to find any full-length benches without something in the middle or any area that homeless people can camp and sleep on. San Francisco has the 10th highest homeless population in the United States. In 2022, San Francisco found that 7,754 individuals were homeless all across just that one city. A cycle of poverty and substance abuse contributes to the growth of the homeless population, and many homeless feel that they cannot escape no matter what they try to do, that they're just stuck on the streets for the rest of their life. Much of the homeless population in San Francisco are primarily locals who have lost jobs and housing and have fallen on hard times, leading to the substance abuse and on the streets. Seattle. In 2022, there were 13,348 homeless people only living in Seattle. The King County Regional Homeless Authority, otherwise known as KCRHA, is in charge of the diversion and rapid rehousing of, of homeless people. Yeah, and as you can see on the screen, efforts to help homeless people on the state properties are seeing steady success, and many of the people being helped off the streets are remaining in housing even weeks or months later. This was quoted from one of the um, government officials in Seattle. But even though they're saying things like that, we still haven't seen any significant change on the fact that they still have the third highest homeless population in the nation. So all of these are examples of different ways state governments can. Uh, so Governor Kotech worked with the legislative leaders to develop and pass an urgent $155 million package to rehouse 1,650 Oregonians for, to prevent homelessness. Um, a lot of what we have talked about before are different ways states can help to solve it through government programs, um, changing things like tax laws or giving more funding to the cities. Basically, instead of directly helping the homeless people, the state governments can aid them through indirect efforts, through money and laws and policies. Uh, this, allow, this is how they can help them compared to local governments, which do it in a much more direct way. So like in 2015, Portland declared a housing emergency and partnered with all the counties to resolve the city's growing homeless rates. Um, other things like just building aid shelters, changing laws and stuff and just different policies about like how cops and hospitals react to homeless people whether when they see a homeless person walking and injured whether they make them leave because they aren't going to be able to pay for it or they treat them nonprofits and charities a large proportion of the organizations that assist with homelessness are in fact religious organizations one example of this is the westland food pantry located in old willamette in the basement of a church Along with other charities like or O R Agonia uh, O R E G O N O N Oregonian Charities.org, which is a Catholic organization that supplies people with food and clothes. These charities are are able to do on site care for the homeless. They can also organize larger food and clothing drives, which will distribute it to the ones who need it most. So the cause. So from what we can tell, these are the key four, five key causes of what has caused this homelessness problem, this lack of affordable housing, the, the, the fact that even if they had money, even if they had a job, they still wouldn't be able to afford a house in places like Portland at minimum wage. Uh, drug addictions and mental health, these things prevent them from keeping the job, which is why the loss of jobs is also very important for causing this. This growth of poverty and inflation, all this has just been made worse by COVID. All these factors just came together to create this horrible situation we're in now. This is what we believe would be the best solution. This is completely opinion. So instead of arresting the drug using homeless, we need to set up rehab centers to give them the opportunities they need to rejoin society. We can't just throw them in jail. That's not going to change anything. We need to mass produce affordable housing in and around cities. We need skyscrapers built with just cheap, small houses, not these mega places for the rich. We need to prevent these large companies from buying up all the housing and raising the prices. We should, by changing tax laws, to prevent it from being profitable from people owning like 25 houses. We also need to provide this temporary housing and mental assistance 
for people who are having these problems so that way they can rejoin society with this stability we offer them. These are the sources that we referenced throughout our presentation. There's a lot of them. Thank yes, you. More.